my name is Renford Reese. I'm a political science professor at Cal Poly Pomona and the director of the Colorful Flags program. Today, we're here to conduct an interview which is a part of the Prison Race series which examines prison culture, the dynamics of race in prisons, and the challenges facing parolees in their efforts to reintegrate back into society. Uh, one objective of this series is to examine the criminal justice system from a multi-ethnic perspective, from those who have been immersed in the system. Uh, we're fortunate today to have one of my favorite students, one of my favorite former students, uh, David Sexton. He's here to share with us some of his insights uh, of his experiences in the criminal justice system. Welcome, David. Hello, Dr. Reese. So first of all, if you could just give us some background information on, on yourself. I know in class you've alluded to, and personally with me in our meetings, you've alluded to your troubled past. Could you just give us some information about your background? Sure. Um, I came from a middle class family. Uh, the term dysfunctional wasn't around at the time, but I guess you could say it was a dysfunctional family. My father was a biker gang member. Uh, he divorced my mom when I was young. I still had contact with him, but you know, I was still immersed in that type of environment from him and uh, he was murdered when I was 12 years old and then my mother had remarried and the relationship was fueled by alcohol and domestic violence. Um, my aunt who I was very close to committed suicide when I was 14. Uh, two weeks before she committed suicide she woke me up in the middle of the night and told me that if anything happened to her it was the police that did it. And when I was 15, my uncle, who was like my surrogate father, I was very close to him, very close to him, he also committed suicide. So by that time, you know, I was a mess. Men you know, mentally, you know, emotionally, everything. It was just my world. Everything I loved and everybody I loved was dead, you know? So when was your first uh, offense, criminal offense? Uh, uh, when I turned 15. Uh, what was it? Could you tell us about uh, it? It was uh, me and uh, two other guys broke into a concession stand at a baseball diamond. So it was burglary. And what were the consequences? Uh, per, uh, probation. Um, but then my uncle, the one who killed himself, was trying to get have me come live with him. And in order to keep that from happening, my mother said I was incorrigible and had me sent to uh, a boys ranch, Verdemont Boys Ranch in uh, Glen Helen. And I did uh, six months there. Okay, now what about your drug usage? When did you start to use drugs? Well, I first tried marijuana when I was nine. I drank, you know, off and on from th that age. But I really began to get heavy into drugs when I was 15. You know, I was a garbage can addict. You know, I'd do anything as long as it got you high. It didn't, okay. didn't matter to me. So just consistently from the time that you were 15? Yes. Uh, until when? Until I was 33. Okay. So tell us about some of uh, some other offenses that you had uh, from uh, an early age. You say you went to the boys' home, but then what happened after you got out of the boys' home? Were you... Uh, corrected where you your problems dealt with at the uh, boys home well <laughs> they attempted to correct my problems I, I, I will give them that you know it was it was a nice place you know they attempted to address some of my emotional issues but actually when I was there that's when my uncle killed himself and my mom had called me up on the phone and told me guess what and I said what and she said well your uncle killed himself you know, she didn't even bother to come in and tell me in person or anything. And that was, that was quite a shock. And I, after that, all their help that they had tried to give me kind of fell to the wayside. And uh, one of the things about being there was you got to work out a lot. 
So I worked out quite a bit, and by the time I got out, I was strong and still getting high and was able to commit my second offense, which was uh, strong arm robbery. You know, so they kind of primed me for <laughs> the uh, ability to create a worse offense. Okay, so what happened in, in, with the strong arm robbery? Uh, there was a guy selling flowers on, on the side of the road, and uh, me and two guys, we were high on PCP, and uh, he was gonna hand him, uh, say he was gonna give him a 20, and he was gonna get two 10s, and when the guy handed him the two 10s, he was gonna snatch the two 10s, and we were gonna drive off. And the guy wouldn't go for it, and I was very, very high. And I don't know, I just jumped out of the car and wrestled him to the ground and put my arm around his neck and told him, if you don't give me your money, I'll break your neck. And so he gave me the money and I jumped up and there was a fire truck that was watching this whole thing going on. And the firemen started chasing me and they drove off and I ran away and I, I got away and spent the money on more drugs and uh, took off to, uh, with some friend of mine, we were gonna go to Kentucky or some place like that. And I ended up coming back and when I went to my mom's house to take a shower, the cops showed up and I was arrested. Okay, and then what happened after you were arrested? Uh, I spent, I wanna say 10 months, maybe a year in uh, juvenile hall until I was 18. And then after I was like, uh, a couple months after my 18th birthday, they released me and this is uh, back into the world. Okay, so then this is all preceding you actually going to state penitentiary yeah. in California. Yeah. Okay, so what happens now that you're 18 years old, you're out, uh, are you still using drugs or are you, have you taken a break from using drugs or have you tried to kind of rehabilitate yourself? Well, I took a break, I would say. Um, I was still smoking weed, but I was working for my uncle and doing construction and, you know, that was hard physical work. So you couldn't really, <laughs> you know, get high. And uh, I just got tired of it and I started hanging out with these guys that partied and, you know, just from there I just fell back into drug use, heavy drug use. Like what types of drugs? Uh, methamphetamines. That was a primary drug? That was my drug of choice, yes. Right. So what did you do to get the drugs if you were not working? Had you been <laughs> fired from your job? Well, actually, I, uh, I met a girl who sold. She was a few years older than me, and she happened to like me. So I hooked up with her, and she kept me high and my friends high and gave me money. So I, eventually, I essentially prostituted myself out. <laughs> you know? Right. right. <laughs> you know, so... Uh, that's how I kept high, and she taught me how to survive on methamphetamines, how to eat, how to sleep, how to function, you know, and still appear normal. Right, so you, you were not working at the time? No, I, I worked on and off occasion, and then towards the end of our relationship, I was working full time, but I was still getting high. Right, so then tell me about what offense led you to go to prison for the first time? Well, actually, it was uh, like a stepping stone of offenses. We, we, had, we had been busted for uh, sales, possession of sales, uh, maintaining a house for sales. Um, I personally was given, uh, they found a sawed-off shotgun in the house, and they put that on me because I had other guns that were legal, but because the sawed-off shotgun was in the house, they put that charge solely on me. And so I ended up with five years probation, which I could not, I mean, I got high the whole time. And, you know, you test for the pro pro probation officer and, you know, after 13 dirty tests there, they put me back in jail in the county. And then I got busted for um, possession a few times, never, just county time. And then I got busted for having knives, uh, what they considered illegal knives, like a double-edged knife or a butterfly knife. And uh, those, I did time on those in the county jail. And then um, 
when I was like 29, I got busted for a double-edged knife. And uh, I went to court and they, the judge told me, you either take two years in prison or if you fight this and you lose, I'll give you five years. And it's like, what are you gonna say to that? I have a choice, two years, you know, or five years. You know, and it's not some district attorney telling you that, it's the judge telling you that. And so I took the two years. Okay, what prison did you go to? Uh, I went to, um, I'm not gonna remember the name. I went to reception at, um, not, I can't remember the name of the reception yard. Okay, and then how long did, did you stay in reception? Uh, three months. And three then months they was in reception. And, 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 then, and then from reception, where did you go? Uh, Avenal State Prison, which is in uh, up north California. Okay, so what was it like when you got in prison? I mean, is, was this uh, something that uh, you had imagined? Was it a shock? Uh, what was it like your first days in prison? Well, I was... I was smart, I guess you could say. I listened to older guys and talked to them, guys that had already been, and understood enough about prison how to keep out of trouble. And so when I got there, it, it, it's horrible. I mean, it's yes, you, you're put there for a reason, but it's still a horrible place to go for anybody. It's not like the media portrays it, but it's still... It's pretty animalistic, pretty, pretty brutal, I guess you could say, on your senses, on your humanity, on everything. And, and, and so in what ways uh, was it kind of animalistic in terms of your, uh, your senses and your humanity? Well, the way the guards treat you, you know, they, you know, you have to strip down for them and bend over and crack a smile and, you know, and they laugh and they make jokes at you and, you know, they treat you like less than human. And then you're, everybody's angry, you know, they're, the convicts are angry, the, the guards are angry, everybody's angry, you know, because they're put in this situation. So it's a very volatile place, you know, not just in terms of a lot of violence, but just because everybody's angry all the time. Right. In the times that I've gone to uh, lecture to inmates, and I've uh, probably uh, lectured to over 500 inmates over the last uh, two and a half years since I wrote my uh, first book, what is obvious and conspicuous is this type of us versus them uh, attitude that really pervades and permeates the entire prison system. So when you got there, were you forced to choose uh, who to click with a gang? Well... In a level two prison, which is still pretty low security, you're not, as a white person, you're not forced, you know, you hang out with white people, you eat with white people, you group together with white people, that's what you do because you're white. It's, you don't have to choose a gang, I mean, there are some people that go in there that want a reputation or, but not in a level two prison, it's, so then what, what, what are the consequences? I know you had alluded to this in our conversation before. Uh, the consequences of uh, not uh, being with the whites. You said that you have to basically self-segregate. What are the consequences of not self-segregating? Uh, you could get beat up, for one. Um, like I, I believe I told you, uh, we were sitting at a table, and uh, this was in, uh, I had a, done a parole violation term. And I was heavily into speed, and I was starving by the time I got to prison. And uh, I was sitting at a table with some black guys, and um, I had finished my meal, and the one guy said, here, do you want some toast? And I couldn't accept the toast from him because he was black. You don't s accept food from black people. You don't smoke after black people. You, you, Nothing like that. That's not. That's just the rules of prison. You never do that. But you can play dominoes with. Them. But you can play dominoes or cards or stuff like that. But even that's, you know, mostly people segregate into their races and that's how they hang. So how? Tell me how this is uh, frustrating uh, to you. You said that uh, the black inmates uh, knew how to do their time. Yeah, they did. I mean, 
if any prisoners see this, I'm probably going to get beaten up. But um, I have always, I'm not, I'm not racially, I'm not a racist person. So I don't, never bother to accept that type of culture. And I always hang, hung out with the black guys because they were funny, they laughed, they knew how to make humor. They, they had been there, they'd have been oppressed you know, for so long, and, and some of them had been in and out and in and out, that they knew how to do time. They, you know, because you see, like, some people in there, they're just, you know, they're freaking out because they're doing time, and they've got, they're counting the days until their, their time out, you know, the time they get out, and they're just, that's what's called hard timing. it. And you never saw black guys do that. They were always funny and tried to entertain themselves and were a good people. You know, good people to hang out with because they told you how it was and, and they treated you, tr they always treated me very well. So I want to put you on a spot and ask you about, I already know your feelings about the uh, Latino uh, population inside of a prison, but tell me some of the frustrations you had with uh, the Latino population inside the prison. Well, according to prison rules, it's the whites and the southern Mexicans are together. They back each other up. And the blacks and the northern Mexicans are supposedly together. And they back each other up. And when you go to county jail, you see uh, Mexicans jumping white guys, beating the crap out of them, taking their shoes, you know, treating them like crap. I mean, they're just as racist as anybody. You know, they're just as racist as the most racist white person. And that, I was in a cell with um, two cons, you know, and uh, there was a guy in there, it was a young, it was a young, young white guy, and the Mexicans wanted his shoes, and he told them no, and so they jumped him, and I started fighting and with, with him, but because of the rush of all the other white people pressing you up against the bars, it was kind of hard to do anything. You know, and they beat him up, and, but then the guard came and they pulled him out and he got his shoes back, but he'd still got the snot beat out of him. And I was sitting there with these two, you know, and they were cons. I mean, they had their prison tattoos and all, and all that. And I said, why didn't you help? You're white. And they said, well, well I don't know if that guy was white. I go, I rode the bus with that guy. That guy was white. Oh, well, you know, they didn't want to have, you know, they're all talk tough when they're, when they're, you know, there's 20 of them, but when there's just th the three of us and that one white guy and 20 Mexicans in a cell, they're not so tough. Right. So tell me about, you know, I wrote uh, Prison Race, the book Prison Race that came out in 2006, and the thesis of the book is that, you know, uh, you have uh, injustices embedded in the criminal justice system based on race. You said that you tested positive, what, 13 times? Yeah, at least. At so, least. so do you think that you got some preferential treatment because you were white? Most assuredly. Most assuredly. I mean, you, I've seen guys, black guys, Latino guys, go into uh, jail or court with probably less of a record than I have and get sentenced to more time than, than I did because I'm white. I mean, face it, you know, I'm glad. I'm happy to be white if that can get me out of jail a couple times. Right. That's great. Right. So now I want you to tell me about your transformation. Uh, you've taken two of my classes. You're one of my better students. Uh, you keep our classes, uh, you kept our classes entertained. Uh, obviously, even in this interview, you're uh, very articulate, very sharp-minded, uh, and you really do have a comprehensive uh, perspective on uh, what is going on in society. You're unique in that you can connect all of uh, the dots around you. So tell me, when did you start to become, uh, you know, to realize your potential and start to uh, change and transform? Well, um, after I got out of prison the last time, I went and lived with a friend of mine who was not involved with drugs. When, when was the last time you were released? Uh, that would be probably uh, 1999. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, I started working at a fast food restaurant, 
and I saved up enough money to uh, put myself into school because I I'm getting old I mean that's one thing about prisoners and drug addicts is the older you get the more tired you get and that being tired leads you to make different choices and so I put myself through school uh, I graduated with honors from Citrus College um, which is a community college. Community college. And uh, I'm a, mem a permanent member of the Alpha Gamma Sigma California Honor Society. Um, I was still high on drugs when I was doing that. Um, but I was, I've always kind of been a functioning drug addict. And then um, my girlfriend, who is a, she has the same story that I have. She's been to prison. Um, she got out, she turned her life around, she went through a woman's uh, sober living house and uh, she became a counselor and then the manager there and so she's really into the 12-step program and uh, I love her dearly, her name's Suzanne and she is graduating from Cal Poly University as well so she's the only other prisoner I know that's done what I've done or attempted to do um, but with her help, I was able to get off drugs. And uh, I don't know, I never thought that would happen. I honestly never, never really thought that would happen. I liked being high. It was, made life interesting. It, you know, it, it soothed something inside of me. And I've been high, uh, been clean now for three or four years. I don't keep count like the the twelve-step programs do, and it's been great. I mean, I, I I love life. I enjoy life now, and I realize that now that you know that the drugs, being a drug addict is the most selfish thing you can be. It really is. It it's it's nothing but selfishness, and uh, I've broken from that, and it's been great. I mean, I'm I've gone to Cal Poly University uh, as a as a, a political science major, I want to become a, a lawyer and hopefully a public defender. Um, but tell me, so you want to become a lawyer and a public defender, but I know that you just applied for an internship uh, here in the city of Pomona about three weeks ago and you were denied. Tell me about that experience and how frustrating that is. Well, it's funny when you, when you're on your, when you're crawling around on your belly nobody seems to notice you know you're below the radar but suddenly when you try to put yourself on your hind feet and stand up that's when everything becomes focused on you if I was still trying to work at Burger King nobody would care you know yeah you're a prisoner fine we'll get some tax breaks blah 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 but now I'm trying to stand up in society and say hey I have a contribution to make hey I can help I mean what I uh, put the application for was somebody that uh, they help uh, indigent people with uh, court and for evictions and domestic violence and just stuff like that and you go and you help them fill out the paperwork and I applied for it and I had a lot of a uh, lot of commendation you gave me a recommendation my, another teacher gave me a recommendation a lot of the students that know me gave me recommendations um, but my background, the Human Resources Division of the court would not accept because I had six felonies and, I don't know, 10 or 15 misdemeanors. And so they would not allow me into the program. And I was angry and hurt, you know. I was hurt because I'm trying to make a difference now. I, I want to be a change person. I want to help people. That's being battered through the justice system made me realize that those people need a voice and and I want to be part of that and how dare they try to deny me the chance you know I paid my debt to society I've done my time I've done everything they asked me to do I've reformed my life how dare they take that stuff from the past eight years ago when it, when that's weighed against what I've done now they just, the, what I've done now should outweigh that by far. And how dare they not allow me to 
give back to society, the, one, the, quote, the quote, the society that I've attempted to bring down by selling drugs and committing crimes, you know, let me give back to society. And, and so you feel that frustration. Yeah, I do. And so it's not just you, it's other parolees who are trying to reintegrate back into society. Well, They're it, facing the same obstacles, right? Exact same op obstacles and, and worse. Because, you know, where I had the chance to go to school and stuff like that, a lot of people are denied that chance because they have drug offenses that, you know, don't allow them to get federal funding or, you know, they just, they don't have no a place to live. They don't have any, something to fall back on. I mean, a lot of the things that makes it hard when you get, when, they, when you get out of prison, they give you $200, they buy your bus ticket from that, and basically $200, that's enough to get high again and, and maybe a motel. Right. You know? Okay, David, I want to uh, thank you for coming in. Uh, I think your story is powerful. It's inspirational. Uh, I've made a commitment to uh, mentor you and to give you advice and give you guidance and give you counseling. And uh, I intend to uh, stick with that commitment. I see the potential in you and I want to help you uh, fulfill your your goals, objectives, and help you to realize your dreams. And so um, I'll be there for you. Okay. Thank you Thank for coming. You. Thank you, Dr. Reese.